Yeah, so uh, what the plan for today really is to um, I want to try and help you think of, think more functionally. Um, hopefully the people who've got some Scala experience are already kind of know that already. Uh, for the people doing Scala, have you, uh, do you think you are thinking functional way already? Or, um, yeah, yeah, Java yeah, without the semicolons? Java without <laughs> semicolons, there we go. Yeah, yeah, Excellent. yeah. So, Which is the reason I, I started to learn Clojure, by the way, because I worried that I was going to end up doing Java with semicolons. And there aren't any the semicolons. The, 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 no. yeah. Well, there are, but well, yes, only the comments. Right, right. uh, yeah, comments. Yes, so, we uh, so what I'll do is I'll it'll be there'll be two part two take two sides to this workshop. So one is to teach you some of the functional concepts, but also show you how they're realised in enclosure, so that you should be at least be able to go away and and you play with closure and and learn around that and understand the environment uh, and make a decision about whether you want to. Uh, keep on using it or whether you want to stick with whatever language you're currently using. <laughs> you might want to stay and wait for Java, uh, Java 13, uh, or you might want to... Uh, hey, I Java 9. Java, Java 9. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm looking forward to Java 9 because it'll make the JVM uh, quicker to start, so which should be great. Which means closure will be fast. Which means closure will be faster, yes. Um, will start faster. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give uh, I'll give a bit of an overview of closure, and again I'll, I'll kind of check with you like how much I need to go into closure, and then we'll go into more of the functional aspects. So if we go to the um, just go to the website in a second. So I'm assuming everybody it has like a Java background at, at some stage. Otherwise, why are you at DevOps? Is anybody uh, is anybody a JavaScript person rather than a Java person? Nobody nobody wants to admit to it. Um, there are there are some there are some really interesting JavaScript people doing uh, Java uh, doing Clojure, and we might touch on that briefly. But uh, I'll mainly stick to a, a Java context. And again, you can do it on the Microsoft CLI, like I've got the you know bit Clojure on uh, Visual Studio as well. Uh, that should be prob uh, possible. Although I haven't tried it. Uh, so you need Java. Preferably, everybody's got Java eight. So if we're not running Java eight, Java nine, Java seven. Yeah, Java seven should be okay. Just if you're running Java 6 or 5. Well, definitely not 5, because that 5 would be bad. Uh, and you wouldn't want to admit to not running Java 5. Um, so you've got that. So, and there's a build tool. So you'll be familiar with uh, things like Maven and Gradle. Uh, so we have a build tool called Liningen. And the hardest thing about using Liningen is actually saying the name. Um, everything else is pretty straightforward. Uh, so it's just uh, Liningen.org. And it's just basically a little script that in self installs it. Uh, it actually downloads a jar file and sticks your jar file in your Maven, your local Maven repository. So if, uh, I assume, has anybody not used Maven? Uh, you've used Maven, sure. Um, so we, uh, you'll probably <coughs> remember Maven creates um, like a .m2 uh, directory in your home folder and then underneath that's a repository. So actually lining goes in, in underneath there with lots of all the other um, Closure jar files as well. So it actually, this uses a lot of the same techniques as Maven. Actually, uses Maven Central to download uh, a whole bunch of libraries as well. And we've also got our own closure specific Maven Central, which is called Clojars, which we'll uh, probably look at at some point as well. So if you uh, if you do the dependency, if you have dependencies, we, it will download them just like Maven will download them for you as well. Uh, so has everybody got lining installed? No? no? Working on it? Okay. Um, uh, I'll just, and then there's Lighttable as well. Um, you don't have to use Lighttable. Uh, it is the pro probably the easiest tool uh, to get going if you don't have a particular choice. Um, the other alternatives are um, Emacs or Spacemax, or you could use um, you can use Cursive if you like IntelliJ. There's a Cursive plugin for that as well. I might take a bit uh, of uh, a few months to set up. Has everybody got some kind of IDE? Sublime is good. Sublime's okay. Um, I don't IntelliJ think IntelliJ you can do some closure in it as well. Yeah, yeah. IntelliJ <laughs> is probably uh, so Sublime's okay for like a quick play around. Uh, but if you're going to like seriously try closure, then you need you really need some kind of editor that does all the things for you. Um, so this does like syntax highlighting, it gives you the auto completion, 
um, of stuff as well. Uh, but the main thing is it gives you the REPL, the runtime environment for uh, Clojure. And so we'll see that in action. Actually, I'll fire that up uh, as well. Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of other tools. I've just listed some suggestions of what you can use as well. There's quite a few different tools you can use, but it seems to be you're either using Lighttable, uh, some variation of Emacs, um, or you're using um, into mainly IntelliJ, but there's a few, I've seen a few people use Eclipse as well. There's a plugin for that. And there used to be a plugin for NetBeans, and I think that I've just talked to Yertan, and he knows somebody who's rewriting a new version of that. Because it was really nice actually. Let's see how we can work with one of the oh, it was, NetBeans was really nice for closure development as well. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty of choices, um, so you're not restricted, which is quite good for uh, I mean, it's one of the advantages of being on top of the Java platform. We can use a lot of the tooling there. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, while you may be kind of finishing off installing stuff, I'll just have a quick. Uh, overview of Clojure. I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, uh, the website's here for reference as well. So I like Clojure because it's, and in a nutshell, it's powerful, it's flexible, and it's fun. It, I really enjoy doing Clojure work. It's 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 a really very really nice language, and in a way, it's spoiled me because I think everything, all the other languages out there now are not quite as beautiful as as Clojure. Once you get used to it, and once you understand it, um, it you do see a lot of the the power in the simplicity of the language as well. It's a very, very, uh, very small syntax, which is why it's quite good for like this kind of workshop, uh, where, you, where you want to focus on some of the concepts and not the actual intricacies of the language. So compared to Java, it, it's tiny. So obviously compared to Scala, it's even smaller. Um, and um, it's uh, not trickle there. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Scarlet Turnip is looking daggers at you. What, what evil <laughs> um, and It's quite nice. So it, it, it for me it was easier to do. Um, it was easier to think about the functional programming uh, because I, I didn't have to think about the, the syntax so much because uh, it, it's basically just uh, I think it's about twelve primitives that make up the entire language, um, which I think I defined somewhere down the. Yeah, there's about 12 primitives, which I think I've written down somewhere, which basically make up the language, and everything else is a, is a function, and uh, it, it allows you to kind of just really focus on thinking about how to design something in, in a functional way, because it is quite different. Uh, so you don't have any classes to define, you don't have traits to define, you're, you're essentially just defining a function, uh, you, define, you might define some uh, data structures as well, and they're all in the scope of a namespace, uh, and that's that's basically your your program design. Uh, so it is really kind of simple, as we'll come to. Um, it's a hosted language, as we've mentioned. Um, it does a really good job at managing state changes. So most of the things you do in Clojure is going to be immutable by default. So it's just like having Java final everywhere. Um, and uh, so it, it's it's probably slightly more immutable by default than Scala is. Um, it's very clear because you basically don't have to specify something as a val. Uh, it, everything is a, a val, essentially. Everything's a, 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 an immutable data structure. Um, uh, but if you want to mutate something, if you want to change the value of something, it, it change its actual value in memory, then you actually wrap something around it called an atom or a ref. And, and we do so inside um, uh, something called software transactional memory. So it's a bit like being able to change uh, a value, but doing it in a, an atomic database, so you know it's kind of always going to change. And the the language itself is managing that for you. It's managing other people trying to change the same value at the same time and not not allowing that. So just like a database would lock a piece of information. Uh, and only allow one connection to do that. This is exactly what's happening with the state changes as well. So we might look at that a little bit towards the end, do a little poker game where you can kind of uh, uh, yeah, make sure that you're getting the right amount of money at the right time. I guess, I guess the only difference is NASM isn't really locking, it's a compare and swap operation. But yeah, but it's, 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 block, it's blocking something else doing it, but yeah. then it queues all the other changes up uh, <coughs> behind it as well. So if two things want to change the same, uh, atom, then whoever gets there first gets to change it, and then whoever, then the, the other one waits, 
and then once this is finished uh, and it's been successful, then um, the other one will be able to run and change that value as well. But it's the it's the closure environment that's managing that for you. You don't, you don't have to do that. So it's like when you went from C and C++, you no longer have to manage the memory because you've got garbage collection. This is like garbage collection, but for state changes. It's the, it's the actual language itself that's managing it for you. And so it's a general purpose language, uh, tiny syntax. It's a dynamic language, uh, so you can change things. You've got the REPL, you can be able to redefine things over and over again. Uh, and so while you're developing the language, while you're developing your application, it's quite quick to change it. You don't have to go through a compile cycle. Uh, if you connect your code to a REPL, it's continually compiling every time you save. So uh, you don't have to go and sit there, press a button, wait for a few seconds for it to compile and then run it. That's happening almost instantly in the background all the time on every single <coughs> change you save. Uh, and as we'll see in the REPL, you get the results back straight away. And you can also do cl closure script. Uh, and there's also uh, an, a strong encouragement to do closure script is basically closure, but you're generating JavaScript instead of generating Java bytecode. Uh, but we encourage people to write uh, the same source and write as much closure as possible that will run on both. So there's there's only a slight tiny differences, only a few things you can't do in closure script for closure script now. Uh, but we have this uh, CLJC, which is like closure uh, closure common uh, file format, which means that, that you can basically run that on any of the different platforms for closure as well. Uh, and there's tons of resources and. Uh, if I haven't completely put you off closure by the end, then I hopefully will see you at the London uh, Closureians uh, meetup sometime. Uh, so when to use closure? Uh, yeah, when dealing with a lot of data, when you want high scalability. Uh, so the first two things, very similar to Scala. Uh, I think that the main difference is, um, uh, certainly for what I've seen is in the third thing, a lot of closure is about reducing complexity instead of managing complexity. And so you often find that Closure pro uh, programs are very small and can compact. But you, you, you tend to use a lot of smaller libraries and, and join them together to build your application rather than having one big application like you do get, in, especially what we used to have in, in Java. We used to have big uh, monolithic applications. Closure is very, like, almost the opposite of that, really. Lots of small uh, libraries you bring together. And uh, there's a whole bunch of people uh, using it. I'm not going to go through those. Uh, and yes, even ThoughtWorks, ThoughtWorks approves uh, closure for use, so that's quite nice. Uh, so there is a lot of brackets everywhere, and one thing that trips people up is this prefix notation. Um, so you see here, we've actually got the plus at the right at the start, instead of being all the way through, so instead of being 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 12 for that, etc., etc., this is actually, it's not an operator like it is in some languages, it's actually a function call. So when this is a this having an open and closed bracket denotes a list, uh, like a data structure. So our language is actually a data structure language as well. So there's this idea of homo iconicity, which means that your actual programming logic is defined as a data structure, which means there's very little ambiguity about uh, the order in which you uh, you can read it. So it's very clear. If you imagine when you're doing mathematics and there's lots of um, yeah, there's lots of uh, different kind of um, uh, 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 operations going on. Uh, where do you start? You have to remember your precedence uh, rules for understanding which do I add? Do I add, do, I do uh, four minus one first? Uh, do I add one two first? With uh, with Lisp, when when everything's um, in uh, prefix order, then there's no ambiguity because you you know that. Um, you do, the, you do the function call on this data, and you get a result back. So here we get 1 plus 2, uh, and this, this would uh, equate to well, what's, what's 4 minus 1? That's 3. So we get 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Um, so it's, there's, uh, using, uh, using closure, it, it's very clear here what the, you just read it. You don't need to know any rules. But we don't have any operator uh, precedence rules. And if you ever see JavaScript, then operate precedence rules, you'll never use JavaScript ever again, because there's about 70, and they're insane. Um, so yeah, it's another reason why uh, closure is really, really simple. Can I just check, if plus is a function there? Yes. Is it applied with a 
single parameter, which is one, and then apply all these two parameters, or three? So the nice thing about uh, Clojure is that it, it encourages uh, a function to be able to take multiple parameters, and then and also an unspecified number of parameters as well. We'll show you some of those examples later on, but you can you can define a single parameter, uh, or you can define it to be able to take your function to be able to take multiple and then an unspecified number, almost an inf well, an infinite number potentially. So it does currying by default then. So what do you uh, do? Uh, it doesn't do currying by default, but it does something fairly similar. It does something called you you, you can it, you can do uh, like partial functions, uh, which is very similar. Oh, partial functions are different from currying. There's <coughs> a similar concept, slightly different in, in implementation. implementation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll so touch, we touch on that a little bit later okay. as well. Because of the, the mathematical works. operator is actually uh, var args, so like you would have in Java, right? Mm -hmm. They they take as many arguments as you want. Yeah. String together. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and so a lot of the a lot of the designer enclosure is around the data structure itself as well. So here we've got a um, here we've got a map. And we know it's a map because it's defined by a c open curly bracket and uh, closed by an open curly cur a closed, a closed curly bracket. And so in the map, a map is just like a hash map. So it's like a key and a value pair. And so here I've got a key of Star Wars. And then the value of Star Wars is another map. So it's all that map itself. Um, and inside that map, so we, we've got more keys and values and so on and so on. So we've also got, uh, uh, as part of the Jedi key, uh, key we've also got uh, a, a vector, which is a square bracket. Uh, so yeah, you can mix and match all sorts of types uh, in there. Uh, you, and again, you don't need to define those types. Closure will work out what the best is, uh, what, what it understands to be the right type. Um, uh, and use that underneath. Yes. Is the white space limit? Uh, no, it just the white space is just for readability. Uh, so there's no delimiter between the array. Yes, that is very true. So uh, there is there is just a white space between uh, Luke Skywalker and Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, you could put comma in there if you wanted to, because uh, commas have absolutely no syntactic meaning in closure. They're just white space. Uh, but some people, especially if they're coming from data science, they like to put commas in between things, but you don't need to. Uh, typically, closure people don't put it in because it's one less character to type, and there's no point putting them in anyway. Sometimes we'll use uh, commas to actually indicate where a value is, would be, like in like a partial or uh, using um, some of the other like little tricks we do to keep uh, the, the language nice and terse. But yeah, normally it's, it's for the humans, it's not for the computer. Uh, and there's macros. I'm not going to cover macros, but it basically, basically it allows the language to be extended. We don't need to wait for uh, the language de designers to be able to extend closure. We can extend it ourselves. We can make things part of the language. So things like defin is actually a macro. So you can define a data structure or you can give it basically a name to a, a value uh, using def. Um, and uh, you can do the same thing for uh, a function. So you can def uh, a function call. So this is an anonymous function uh, here. Um, and what we're doing is giving it a name. So we're using def to define a function um, as this anonymous function. Um, so that's the that's the normal kind of built-in function enclosure. But then there's a macro called defin, which allows us to just write just a little bit more simply. And we can just define a function uh, with its arguments and then its behavior as well. So that's the, it, so macros are really there when there's an opportunity to make the, the 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 language more elegant by adding more stuff to it. So the, a lot of the language itself was designed with macros and functions. Uh, so I remember, I, like I said, there's about 12 uh, primitives that made up the language, 12 special forms we call them, uh, and these basically are extended by people writing functions, people writing macros, and there's about si 650 functions you can call uh, inside Clojure Core. And some of those are macros, some of those are functions, and some of them are the, the basic primitive types of special forms. Um, and then people have built other things. P sometimes in a library, there'll be macros in there as well, uh, like def projects, which is actually helps you define a project. Uh, that's a macro. Uh, and it just makes it a simpler way to actually define that project as well. 
So let's actually create a project. Let's do something rather than just sit here and uh, listen to me waffle. Because um, the next section is like re-evaluate print loop. I think the best way to do that is actually just to um, um, to actually use it. Um, so I'm just going to open up a terminal, uh, and hopefully you've got Lining in installed by now. Yeah, it's running as well. Is anybody not? Anyone not got Lining in? It's installed Fig Wheel isn't on it, and it's still working on it. You don't need Fig Wheel yet. Uh, you only need Fig Wheel if you're going to do closed scripts, but uh, uh, so Lining in is all right. So just go into some kind of uh, directory where you want to put your projects. I'm just going to do project closure, and then you can do line, new, uh, and then whatever the project name you want to call it. Uh, I'm just going to call it Playground, I think. Oh, I could call it DevOx. I'll call it DevOx UK, there we go. I'll call it DevOx UK, like that. Because. And then it creates a project for me, just like uh, doing um, Maven New, Gradle New, um, or Rails New, if you're that kind of thing, way inclined. Uh, and then if I go into DevOps, um, then I've got a uh, folder structure, and just to show you the folder structure, it's pretty simple. It's not that different actually from a um, Java project. Um, and uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so we've got uh, a source path, and we've got a test path. Um, and underneath that, so when we created the project, it's created our namespace for us, our packaging structure, as it were. So uh, we've got DevOps UK core, so our namespace will be DevOps UK and then core, and everything else that we want to call will be within inside that namespace. And we can define, we can add other pro other um, closure files underneath here as well. So this is a quite common way of doing things. You can just have things under source and not have a a qualified namespace, but uh, typically we do it this way. Uh, and what you'll notice is that um, I created a, a project called DevOps UK, uh, whereas what it's done here is done DevOps no underscore. underscore. <coughs> and does Money know why it's underscore? Because dash is not a uh, valid directory name. Yes. In in some in some platforms. In, yeah. in the JVM, in the JVM. Yeah. The yes. yeah. yeah, so the JVM <coughs> doesn't like dashes in names, don't know why, um, which is unfortunate because uh, that's the convention. If you've got two words, rather than using camel case, I, I can't remember what, Scar does Scar use camel, ca um, camel yeah, case? Yeah, it's camel yeah. case. So <laughs> we, in closure we use kebab case, as in shish kebab, not okay. doner kebab. Sometimes called lisp but kebab case is, kebab case is more fun, yeah. it's more descriptive than that. so kebab case is, uh, is what I used when I uh, when I created uh, this project so it's uh, having a dash in it so if you imagine the the words are the meat and the dash is the skewer that goes in between it uh, that's how you do it it's uh, it's a nice way to remember how you do it and it's just a nice convention that uh, like I think pretty much universally everybody uses uh, I find it a little bit more readable as well than um, camel case so that's quite nice uh, and the only other thing here is the project file. So we'll just have a quick look at that. It's a very simple one because we haven't, we've, we've just basically used a very basic template. Um, we could also create something, uh, um, you don't have to do this. I'm just going to show you. So this is created another, oh, that's not right. Sorry. Uh, brain fell for a second. That, ooh. Oh, I've got, there we go. Uh, so, uh, we're going to create a bigger app, a web app, uh, something called Luminous, which is a... Luminous, and the end's missing up to be oh, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> it's been a long week. Uh, there we go. And a, and, a, and a good party last night. Yeah. I only had two drinks last night. I didn't see you at the party, though. I was there. Yeah, was so you can see what, it, what it's doing is it's downloading uh, oh, it looked from Maven Central. It's like downloading mm -hmm. POM files, downloading Java files. Uh, Java files. Um, so this is how a, a larger uh, closure project is built up with. Um, so there's a lot more dependencies, uh, libraries, a lot more libraries in this uh, language, quite a lot, actually. Um, it's 
may never end. But if you're used to using Maven, you're probably used to seeing this kind of screen as well. So, um, although once again, once it's downloaded these things, if you haven't changed the versions, then it won't um, create new ones as well. Uh, but the uh, if I go into uh, uh, and do tree again, it's it's r roughly the same. It's got a, few, a whole bunch more cool. stuff in there, uh, but yeah, it's got some M environment stuff. You got like different uh, environments. You got dev, production, test environments as well. Um, you have got a prop file if you want to deploy it to Heroku. Mm -hmm. um, that's, and, uh, that's awesome. Uh, but you still got the source and test directories as well. So. You, it's a familiar kind of structure for like Java developers to uh, go and delve into. So let's have a look uh, at um, the project file. I'm just going to open it in Emacs, but you can open it in anything you want to. Uh, so I'm going to use um, project uh, closure. Uh, what did I call it? Uh, DevOps UK. <coughs> Um, so it's what? What do you think this is? What kind of data structure is it? Uh, oh yeah, well ca almost. Which which one? Are you, where are your cursor? The the the, the big one. The big one. The, the, big one, the, the whole external thing, one. The whole the thing whole is thing. a data structure. A it's a list. Yes. Uh, so it's a, a, a round brackets uh, around the whole data structure. So this is actually a list because dev project is. Essentially, a function function call, which will take everything else as as data. So all the rest of this is actually just data that's going to be sent to the dev project function. Um, but yes, I can see why you set it to map because we use these uh, we use these keywords. So we basically we've kind of got a an unofficial map here. Um, it's like a map like thing. It's a bit like a JSON file. Um, so you've got um, yeah keys and information there, and that's just a, a nice kind of structure that we use in Clojure anyway, whether we use a map to surround it or not. Um, when they developed Lining and they chose not to put that in a map. Why didn't you put the column before the fix me? Uh, so fix me is just a string. <laughs> yeah, but to be consistent, of course. Right? Uh, yeah, so fix me is a... Uh, that's just a, it's just a document. It's, it's like a documentation yeah. convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. he's being a little bit cheeky as well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. So you mean colon before the HTTP as well, just to be uh, consistent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that would that would that would be bad. That would, yeah. wouldn't work very well. Uh, but yeah, so when you put a colon in front of a, a, a name, then that becomes something called a keyword. So um, just like you can look up a key in a map uh, by just like asking for the key. Uh, a keyword is a bit like that, but anywhere. So you can you can basically look up a keyword and it points to itself. Mm -hmm. So you can basically just like find and any piece of information just by associating it with a keyword. So it's a really nice way to, yeah, like like putting a pin on a Google map. You can you can go like, straight to that place without having to do any lookups or anything like that. So it's quite a really quite nice way. Essentially, it's just a, a name, uh, but a name that instead of pointing to another value that we've defined, it's a name that's just pointing to itself. So it's a nice way to look at. And mostly we use it in maps, which is why somebody said that must be a map. And I thought it was a map when I first saw it as well. Um, so, uh, well, so and the only real thing uh, that of interest in here uh, is this dependency line. Uh, so we use uh, we use a, a vector, a, like an array-like structure, to uh, to manage all our dependencies. And what's the dependency here? It's a pretty obvious question. Java eight. Java 8, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost, except it's got that C word in there. Yeah, okay, closure. 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 One closure, closure, closure. So what we haven't actually done is install Closure. It's just a library. It's actually quite a small library. Last time I checked, it was about 3.6 megabytes. So that's and that's for the whole language, and for the reader, and for the evaluator, and for the compiler that makes it into Java bytecode. That's a whole lot. How big's the JVM? 230 kilobytes, something like that. 
Uh, the no, new, last time the I new Jane Java 9 is going to be, it's it's going to be like yes. 19 megabytes, yeah. which is slightly bigger than Clojure, but it's okay. Yeah. So yeah, but Clo Clojure is existing inside yes. the JVM, inside so we're being a little unfair. Yeah. Yeah. And it does have the JVM as well, as well itself, so uh, it would be interesting to see how big Java is outside of the JVM. Uh, that will be interesting. Um, but it is a really tiny language, um, and we do use a lot of libraries. Obviously, that would make your application a little bit bigger. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's quite easy to... Uh, to package up inside your own application. And one of the things you can do is if you don't have closure in your environment, in your deployment environment, in your live production environment, uh, and you can't get your operations guys to install closure, you can actually deploy your application with the closure jar as well. So you can basically create a jar out of your application, just like you would do any other uh, closure or Scala application, uh, and, and deploy it that way. But if you create a jar with closure in it, then you don't. You can just run it on the Java virtual machine without any other dependencies. So if you wanted to, you could sneak it in. That's going to be slightly fatter than the other version. Right? Yeah, about 3.6 megabytes. Oh. Which is why I mentioned how big it was. Uh, so it's not very big. Uh, so it, it is doable. Obviously, if you're going to use closure officially, then you don't need to do that. You can just include closure once inside your uh, environment. Um, cool. Let's These see. Uh, yes, uh, your if you've got a good editor, editor yes. Um, so, for example, uh, what have we got? I think we've got some code up somewhere, have I got? There we go. Uh, bo -bo 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 -bo. What was I looking for? Uh, oh, there we go, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I can, um, if I make that bigger, oops, what should I do? There it's tiny. Yeah, if it, I can start to do map, and it should tell me what map is, and... Um, light yeah. table probably does that as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. light table does as well, so I can, um, uh, uh, yeah, I can include a map, oh, that creates a map. i also got snippets in here as well, which will, um, I can do def, and, and it'll create uh, uh, a, um, a shell of my def for me, so I can do my function. And then tab through and do what this this is a doc string, and then tab through and args, and then. Uh, so, like when you did dependent with each of the project definition, it would have told you to put them in the row vector. Uh, yeah. Thing the vector uh, yeah. So if I go back to the. Um, well, kind yeah, of. It so doesn't know the structure of the def project, but. Yeah. So you'd have to know the keywords and the. And the dependencies, but, but which one's the dependency and then the version you're taking Yeah, but generally yeah. speaking, you create it the way John did at the beginning. So you yeah. use the line tool, which has a bunch yeah. of templates. So you'll have a templated version of it, and if you want to add a new dependency, mm -hmm. right. it's pretty obvious that you're going to have to put it in. You just see that you copy the line above and change it to whatever. Yeah, it and so you can have multiple <coughs> dependencies in here. You would just basically put in, and because this is essentially a vector of vectors. So a uh, you know, dependency is is put in a vector. The reason we use vectors is because you can just dump anything in there. Uh, it's very free form. You can put anything in there. There's some uh, there's some uh, s uh, structure in here because of just the way that project works. Um, so you put in the name of the, um, the the library and then the version, just like you do with um, uh, Maven. In fact, if we go to uh, we go to closures. Then um, we can do uh, search for ring, and it will give me uh, the the, uh, the dependencies. There's quite a few different ring um, libraries. Yeah, there we go. That's the one. What's this library for? Uh, this is so it's uh, help you build web web applications. Um, so it's the closure equivalent of uh, servlet, really, and that HTTP servlet nice. route, yeah. and it, it just. It's a lot simpler and a lot smaller. Yeah. But so this gives you uh, <coughs> the dependency string for Lining and for Gradle and for Maven as well. Um, so it's the same, the same kind of uh, system we use. Um, we uh, okay. Um, let's see what was doing. There we go. Uh, oops, that's point. Oh, there we go. Um, and uh, yeah. So. So that's kind of what, and, and then you can fire up a repulsive if you're in, um, you're in 
light table. Uh, is anybody using light table? What's everybody else using? Who's using Emacs? No. Who's using Intelli uh, IntelliJ cursive? Who's just sitting here listening to me because I'm awesome? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sublime, okay, there we go. Uh, oh, pro, pro, I guess the issue with Sublime, I think there is a plugin, isn't there, for Sublime, but um, I'm not sure how to install it. Okay, right. You might find autocomplete and stuff. It's a bit of a problem. Yeah. So, sorry? Yeah, if, you, if you're using Sublime, just you just do things in the REPL and load, you need to load things into the REPL uh, if you're adding, or just restart the REPL each time, which is a bit slow. But you can, uh, there's also a load command, uh, which will load in the file uh, from the project. Uh, I can't remember what that is, I'll have to Google it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if you're in, if you're in light table, uh, you, you basically go to the end of a, uh, an expression, something's happened with the, um, you go to the end of the uh, um, the code in the last closed bracket, and you press uh, uh, Control Enter, and it will start a, a REPL for you. Um, I'm just going to start a REPL in Emacs as well. Um, Zeppelin or something. For Zeppelin. Zeppelin? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, so, so uh, uh, well, compiler interface interface for Zeppelin for, you, you use it usually for Spark or Scala or something, right? You have your, your uh, Jupyter notebook like interface, web, inter web interface where you have your repo. Uh, I've not come across Ze Zeppelin before, um, okay. but it sounds like it might work, but I haven't, I haven't tried that. I don't mm -hmm. have to Google that. But uh, yeah, you, you can always do you, you can always do uh, the REPL on the command line. So if, if you're in the the project space and you've got the uh, the pro, uh, the project file in here, you can just do line REPL uh, and start up your REPL. And um, it's it's downloaded a whole bunch of things because I added the ring uh, dependency. Um, but if it's if it has all the dependencies, then it will just start. Uh, it will take a few seconds because it's basically spinning up a JVM, and um, I'm not using Java 9 yet, so uh, uh, it will be a little bit uh, slow. I shouldn't have really added uh, Ring. <laughs> I reinstalled this computer, so I don't have any of these libraries cached, unfortunately, otherwise it would be a bit quicker. Um, what OS you went? What distribution have you got on there, John? The uh, latest one. Is it Ubuntu we're using Arch? <laughs> You're just uh, blaming uh, closure slowness to your not installing this and that the other. Right? Well, yeah. no, if once it's just like Maven, right? So once you've once you've used these libraries, they'll be in your .m2 directory, so you won't yeah, download them again. Yeah. Unless you change unless you change the version. Yeah. So once you've got the repo running, it, it ba this is basically what happens. You, you, um, you write your expressions, so you write your closure code. Um, and then you basically um, tell, uh, you send that to the, to the REPL to be evaluated. Uh, there's something called a reader which basically parses your uh, code, which again, the reader is quite simple because your, uh, your code is already in a data structure. So basically it just sees if it needs to replace anything. Um, and, uh, and then basically creates the structure in in the programming line, uh, in the way that the computer is going to use it, and the evaluator turns it into Java bytecode and injects it into the JVM. So you're continually injecting any new changes into the JVM as you're going along, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's just like magic. So yeah, it just basically comes in, runs and runs on top of the JVM, and off you go. So you can basically just keep on writing your code and, and testing it out as as you as and when you want to. So so uh, so if you're in, if you're in light table, you just basically um, you would just go to the end of the code and press Control Enter, and it would fire up. Or there's an open there's connect to REPL. In I've done the same thing in Emacs as well. Yeah. Uh, if you're actually in the REPL itself, um, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, you can 
but you can do uh, load. You, you can do use um, uh, the actual, and then just specify the namespace, which was devbox dash uk dot call. Uh, oops, what did I do wrong there? Did I get that wrong? What did I do wrong? You, uh, uh, you're in a raw wrapper, you won't have to load the file first. <coughs> I thought it loaded the file. Should have loaded the file already. Not if you, not if you, how did you start your REPL? Line REPL? Yeah. Uh, you should have, yeah, should have. How did you load it again? Inside, when yeah, you're inside the, the package, it load, inside the project, it automatically load it. I did, I thought I did. With the, the use yeah. command, shouldn't it do? Yeah, yeah, it should do that. But uh, did you, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it's inside the project. It's now. not called dev, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're in the web app project. Oh, uh, that's why. And, mm -hmm. uh, John. Yay. Well spotted, mate. All right, can we swap places? Yeah, <laughs> you should teach. Come on then. Come on up. Come on then, if you want to do it. Come on, damn, man. Maybe uh, tomorrow I can run the workshop for you. You can do it. I'm doing it all day tomorrow. Uh, oh, oh, you okay. can. It should be. There we go. It's quick enough. Um, yeah, so I can uh, use. Um, So one of the advantages of using line table or Emacs or Space yeah. Max or any of the cursive is that you've got the REPL bound, you can bind the REPL into your editor. Whereas if you're using Sublime, I think there might be a plugin to do it, but it's, if you've just got Sublime without that, you, you're going to have an editor and a REPL and two different things, they're not connected. There's nothing you can do about it because the editor can't support the REPL. So, so uh, in my, so by default it creates a function called foo. Um, the foo takes a single argument and, and basically just prints that line out. So I can, in in the REPL here, I've, I've told it to use it, which is a bit like doing a, like an import, like a dynamic, dynamically importing that uh, namespace into, because if you see from the prompt, I'm actually in the user namespace, which is the default for a REPL. And it's got some of the tools in like uh, doc, doc, so you can call them, um, you can call the doc string on a function called doc, or you can do doc map uh, and find out what that function does as well. So the, all the all the documentation is built into the language itself as well, so it's quite easy to uh, connect to it. There's also uh, versions on the web as well if you want to search for that. What are you doing um, by doing that use? What's the purpose of that? Uh, well, it, the user... Well, it returned a nil as well, right? Because it's a function. The, us, the user, it's a namespace. It's like just like a packaging hierarchy. In, oh, in Java. oh, so you so, so, uh, so, so, no, like. so yeah. the user yeah. namespace holds uh, closure.repl library, which has got all these tools in, and they aren't in the other. They aren't in the DevOps UK namespace. So that's why I've I've stayed in user namespace, so I can use those tools, uh, and then just imported DevOps UK core into that namespace. So it's like I've written that code in that namespace. Oh. Um, so when you start the REPL, it's, it's a base environment, and then you build this build, build yeah, this project yeah. in on top of it. Yeah, it, it knows mm -hmm. that the, the namespace is available, but I just haven't told it to load it in, and then I say use, and then it's, it you makes all those functions inside that namespace available for me to use. And why um, do you start with the apostrophes, like use apostrophes devops.uk.core? Yeah, so uh, devops.uk dot core is is actually a name for the namespace so without the quote uh, it will actually try and evaluate that namespace and return me the result of that namespace okay. what I want to do is just make that available I so I want to be able to have a, a reference to it rather than getting a result from that namespace okay. so for another example is um, uh, if I I can I can call list one two three four uh, and I'll get a list of one two three four um, you can also do the uh, same thing for vector, vector, one, two, three, four, and I'll get a vector. And I can actually do a vector in the short form. I can do one, two, three, four, and it'll return a vector for me. Um, you close it with. There we go. <coughs> if I type properly, there we go. Uh, but if I do the same thing with the list, then uh, what do we know about lists? Well, I don't know if we've explained this one. Well, this is what I'm First thing I'm it's a collection. This one I'm trying to tell, I'm trying to gauge whether it's I actually explain it or not. It's a collection. It's what's, what's one? Or what isn't one? What, what, what is one not? A function. 
it's well, not, not a function. So yeah. is this going to fail or do something? It's going to try to execute fail. every element of that. Just so it's going start it's with one. It's basically complaining that um, something isn't a function, isn't isn't uh, obeying the function interface. So uh, which is basically the value one, because value one is a value. It's not a function call. I haven't I haven't gone in and done def and one and then done some arguments and done that, and I'm not going to execute that because I don't know what will happen. But uh, yeah, if I've done that, then it might actually work. With one. But um, yeah, I think I think the name, yeah, you can't do that with the naming. Um, but it actually but tells you, you can, so it's a Java uh, long. <coughs> yes. But you actually, yeah, it does write the end, but it's a little bit kind of cryptic. Some of the, some of the messages are a little bit cryptic because they use the Java uh, way of like reporting the bugs. So you, but you're used to that, so that's not too bad. Uh, but if the point I was trying to make was that if I, so if I do uh, a list of just values, it's going to be a, uh, an error. But if I actually use the little quote sign, uh, I can actually do a, I can actually use a list of values, uh, and that's legal. It evaluates for itself because it's basically saying, just treat this as data. Don't try and do a function call. Don't try and treat it as some behavior. This is just pure data. So the only difference between that and that is just basically the single quote. Although quote actually is sh shorthand for the quote function, uh, and that's exactly the same. So, so the list is quite special because it has a special context for the first element of the list. It's always interpreted as a function call, um, and if it doesn't have the quote in, it will try and evaluate it as a function call. You put the quote in front of it, then it doesn't. And if you use that same same kind of technique uh, again, when we used uh, we did use, uh, we did that uh, with the uh, with the namespace as well. And it just means I want to use the reference to it. I don't actually want to <coughs> evaluate it. Yeah. Uh, and there's some other examples we might get to, but that's essentially it. So you can do things in in the raw REPL, um, and I've dabbled with that as well. But uh, typically, you would do things in an editor. That's connected to a REPL, it is much more, much faster. And so, in here in DevOps View, I can uh, I can evaluate this. Uh, I can evaluate the whole. I've just evaluated the whole of the code. Um, and so, it's evaluated the namespace and uh, this function. And so, I can actually just call foo uh, with. With uh, an argument, and then I can evaluate that, and it'll give me the result. Oh, but it's nil. Why is it giving us nil and not hello world? Oh no, what's gone wrong? Well, if we do something different, if we actually change print line to uh, string, and then do that again, so I've just reevaluated that definition of foo, and I run Fred, and I get Fred hello world. Um, so that's actually returning as a value, but if I do print line, that's a bit of a naughty function. That's actually going to uh, cause a, a side effect, uh, which is not so good. Um, and I think I have to open up. Uh, oops, wrong. Uh, if I open up my uh, closure REPL window, which is cider. Uh, oh, there we go. So I've actually got the. Um, the result of print line actually goes into the the repl. It basically goes into the command log. Um, okay, yeah. And so uh, if you're doing it on the command line, if you're doing it in the line repl, then you would see it. Um, but it's it's not it's the re the value that this is returning if you do uh, print line is is actually does appear in the uh, as as a value here, but the value is nil because it's uh, Print line doesn't actually return a value except for the fact that value, uh, nil is actually a value itself. It's a legal value in Clojure. Um, so the side it creates a side effect by printing the string out to the console log. Um, so if you're doing a very pure approach to functional programming, you wouldn't use print line because you're actually printing out things to a different part of the system. You're actually affecting a different part of the system. Which is how some people actually view um, the uh, how people view uh, functional programming. It's they try and have a very pure approach to uh, functional programming, uh, 
closure is quite pragmatic in that you can be as pure as you like, um, although most people tend towards fairly pure and not have uh, too many, so because it does help reduce the complexity of uh, your application as well. Uh, so just go back to here. So I've got a whole bunch more of examples in this workshop, but I was actually going to skip to uh, some of the uh, functional programming principles. Um, so this is basically how C and Java and um, C++ work. They basically have like this um, kind of iterative, uh, sort of imperative approach to uh, programming. So you basically have all these statements. They may update something. They might update some variable. They might change some state. Uh, whereas uh, functional programming, you basically have a function that may uh, have another function as an argument uh, and call that function uh, and get that value and that might call another function and so on. So functions are kind of often chained together and you basically go down the path and evaluate the, the most inner function and they use that value as the, the relative argument for another function and so on and so on and so on. So your actual program, you can see that as just one function. One function you call and then that does things that basically talk to other functions and you're passing information around between those functions as well which is um, a quite different in terms of actually developing it where between the you know, approach where you're, you're defining objects with uh, some behavior and data. You're in enclosure, you basically have namespaces which have uh, some behavior that work on, um, on data as well. Uh, but each of those arguments, each of those functions are, are getting uh, arguments and passing those values around. And we'll see that as we uh, look into like functional composition. So it's essentially composing these functions all together, um, which is a little bit dry. It's the theory of it. We'll, we'll kind of delve into examples of that and try and explain that a bit more in detail as we go along. Um, so I do have a, do some slides and a, a video of me. Oh, there we go, uh, which I won't go through. Um, so just to kind of explain this a little bit uh, quickly, um, so if you've got a function and you give it some arguments uh, and you, you get a, uh, a value in return, that's a very nice, simple, pure function. You can actually reason about what a function actually does. So if you've got add and you give it one and two and you get three back, then you can pretty much be fairly certain that what it's doing is adding those two numbers together. It's very simple. If you uh, give it, uh, if you have a function called add and it, it returns uh, 1.375762.9, you think, what is it doing? Uh, it, it's very it's very hard to kind of reason about it. Like, it, it. It's probably pulling something else in from somewhere else, or it's it's being affected by something somewhere else. It may be sharing state, so what you feed into it, it's either not using, or it might be being affected by something else. If you have state, if you're using state, shared state between functions, then it can be very uh, difficult to have a predicted understanding about what your function could do. So you should be able to call a function with the same uh, value, same arguments, over and over again, and you should always get the same uh, result. So you, your application becomes much more deterministic, it's much simpler to reason about it. So let's look at some of those, some examples of that. Um, so if I go to, well, I'm going to close that one. Um, I've got uh, some examples I did earlier, which we're going to go through. Um, closure. Uh, so this is from my closure through code uh, examples, and I've got in the source um, closure code um, functional concepts. So I've got some examples of um, whether something's a uh, pure function or not. So here I've got, uh, and that's the thing I just added, isn't it? Oh, let's get rid of that. Uh, comment that out. So here I'm defining a function uh, called incorrect numbers. And I'm going to give it a, a, a number collection uh, as an argument. That's what the argument is called. Uh, and then when I'm going to, what I'm going to do is basically increment every value in a collection. So it's a bit like an iterator. I'm going to iterate over a collection, and each uh, each number I'm going to uh, 
uh, run this function on top of. So map basically pulls out number after number out of the collection, applies the function uh, that's associated with map into it, in this case ink, uh, and then builds up a new collection and then returns that. So this should be a nice, this is a nice example of a, a pure function. So I've just evaluated that function and um, I give it one, two, three, four, five, and it returns two, three, four, five, six. Um, but it hasn't actually changed uh, anything. It's just created two, I've got basically got two separate uh, lists there. So, that, so do you kind of get what I'm getting at when I say a pure function? So I do have uh, some tests on here. Um, so we go to the pure function section. Um, so I've got little, uh, where we've got the blue sections, this is a little exercise to do, although my, low, my little icons have shrunk for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so if you, um, so the idea is that basically write a pure function that adds two numbers together. So that uh, should take you hopefully less than a minute to do. Uh, and if you've finished, you can press the little button there and it shows you the answer. Um, so have a quick try of that. And if you get really stuck, wave at me on, or just sit there for a couple of minutes and I'll show you the answer in a second. Should be easy for Chris, Howie Jones. I'm done, mate. Hmm. Oh, Captain. I'm d I need to straighten my microphone. Oh, adapter. Uh, I'm not sure I've got that. I didn't come with it. Otherwise, Chris will get you one. Uh, I don't think we've got any. Uh, no, I think. I was asking for them earlier and there weren't any. Oh, actually, I don't have it the other way around, do I? No, you'll have the UK to Europe, won't you? I will. No, yes. Uh, no, sorry. Has anybody got a Europe to UK plug adapter by any chance? Maybe, maybe one person. We shall see. Otherwise, you'll have to pair program. Oh, there we go. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you. Have you done it, Chris? Yeah. No, no, not Chris. Me, I've done it. Oh, Manny. Manny's okay. done it too. So it uh, should be fairly straightforward. And um, if you've done it, congratulations on writing some closure code. Um, so basically, um, my example here is just basically, yeah, created a name you function. You copied mine. I did. I did. It's like psyche. Create a name function. I've got two arguments, and I basically call it with those two arguments. Um, <coughs> and that's pretty straightforward. Um, and they didn't, has anybody done the example with the map as well? That's surprisingly simple. Similar to the one I just showed you. <laughs> I'm being the same. Uh, you can forget the update, sorry, because yeah, I, yeah, I haven't actually finished that one yet. So. If I'm using this pure record, yes. do I have to stop the record and restart? The code? Uh, you don't have to, but it is one way to do it. Um, you could do use again. If you do use again. I'm not sure uh, whether with a with a reload. Maybe? I think I, yeah, you might have to do, do use reload. colon reload. So I think it's uh, or or you do a load file. Yeah. Uh, Where's it gone? Uh, it's a load file the function I just do that and reload something. Yeah, but you'll have to get the pass name right, so it's a bit fiddly. I think that, that I think might that work. might work. Yeah. But again, I'm not. I don't use the reference, mm -hmm. but that might work. Because it base. Because I think if you use, if you call use again, it, it'll just say, "Is it already defined?" So yeah, I don't need to define it again. Then. Uh, but it won't pick up the change. But if you do reload, it should pull in the new version of it. It did pull in the new version. Woo! It dropped out. I've learned something. Cool. There we go. I do know my clothes. I used to do that ages ago when I used mm. to know. Mm -hmm. I used to do things with Bruce. Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, so the map one is, is pretty much what I did here. Um, so let's, what if we actually do something, did I actually do the impure function section? Oh, I did, yeah, there we go. So let, let's look at impure functions uh, as, a, as an opposite. So here I've got this um, slightly giveaway name called uh, global value. Um, uh, so with, when you 
when you're defining something uh, in a namespace, then it, it, it's in a sense it's global to that namespace. Everything inside that namespace can call anything that you've defined. Um, the exception is uh, you can create uh, private functions. You can do a def and minus, and that's a function that you can only call uh, from another function in that namespace. Uh, and you can actually do, you can put some metadata on the def uh, to say, to do the same kind of thing as well, but there's no actual, there's no def minus, um, just because it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense inside uh, Clojure. Um, so here, uh, I, I'm doing, uh, I've got a name called def global, which points to a list. Um, and I'm calling uh, impure, uh, impure increment numbers, kind of giveaway name uh, with uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and my global value was 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, so when I run this function, what what value do you think I'm going to get? What's it doing that it probably shouldn't be doing? Yeah. So I'm not going to get 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, am I? I'm going to get uh, 6, 5, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Because it's not actually using number collection that I passed in. Um, and I, you don't typically do this, but sometimes you will pass in one argument, uh, but you'll pull in another value from somewhere else as well, rather than pass it, passing it as an argument. It might not seem like it's much of a bad thing, but it does pull in more complexity as well, especially if you're importing other uh, libraries into your namespace. Uh, if you're not passing them as arguments, it's not as blindingly obvious what where things where things are actually coming from. Um, and here's some other examples as well, like using import date. So here we're doing uh, import Java util date, uh, just so we can use the Java uh, date functions. Uh, just as a note, this is basically how you're doing Java interoperability. So this is just like uh, an import statement in Java, just importing a Java library called Java util date. Uh, and actually, everything inside uh, java.lang is already available to your um, Clojure environment already. So you can use all the functions in there already. Um, and here, we're actually, yeah, we've basically got this uh, task uh, complete uh, function we're going to call. Uh, and basically, what it's doing is it's going to mark a task complete at a particular time. Um, but we're actually going out and calling. Um, Java util date within inside the function, which again might not seem that big an issue, but then we don't we can't see that from this this function's API as it were. We, if we just looked at the name and the arguments, we don't we don't know where it's getting its date from. Um, so a more functional approach, a more pure approach, uh, would be to actually create uh, something called current date uh, and actually then pass that into um, pass that into the, uh, the function as a value. And that way it's really explicit where that's getting from. Um, so it's it's quite a small thing, but it does make a lot of difference, especially as your applications do tend to grow. Um, and we got, how long are we doing? How long are we here till six o'clock? Oh my God, that's a long time ago. Maybe not. So, so you wouldn't be able to run that in the REPL, right? The previous one that you just showed? Uh, yep. Can do that now, cool. In the REPL, how yeah. do you put that on the next line? Oh, with the REPL. Ah, yeah. You, if you uh, if you do it, the REPL. Do you just leave it, you, can you leave it on the same line? Will it take it as? Yeah. So if yeah, I if I do yeah. that, uh, if an, uh, you, can, oh, you can put it on the separate lines. You've got a partially completed. Uh, yeah. If you just press enter. Function. You press enter. Yeah. Cool. Just press enter, and I could do. Uh, uh, as long as you close, yeah. Because once you close the expression. Then, then it will evaluate it. So it knows enough to kind of understand when you've closed your uh, enough enough brackets for you, and then I can I can basically evaluate Fred. Right, Fred, Fred is Fred. There we go. What more could you want? Um, yeah. See, I, I, that freaked me out first because I didn't know what it was, and I realised it was just a complete. I think Python uh, REPL does it that way as well, and maybe some other one. I can't, it's been a while since I used Scala. Scala does it, it's just a different continuate. Mm. Continuation because it's bars and it's bars. Okay. Uh, groovy. I'm 
it's groovy. not groovy, it's crazy. I haven't used groovy for a while either. <laughs> but they are both dynamic. Uh, there we go, let's uh, first class functions. Um, so basically, um, yeah, we're writing a whole bunch of functions, but the interesting thing about a function is that when you evaluate it, it always evaluates to a specific value. There's no void in uh, enclosure. Uh, there's nil, which is, but nil is a legal value. It has semantic context in the language. Um, it's false, I think. It's nil false. It is false, yes. Nil is false. It's and surprisingly, it's falsy. It's falsy, yeah. <laughs> surprisingly, false is false as well. But pretty much everything else is true. Everything especially else true. is true. <coughs> yes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, well, so truth. it's, if you're doing any Boolean, any predicates, then, um, yeah, you can treat nil as a, as a false. You don't need to do anything like minus one weirdness, you can use to say, oh yeah, I didn't get, uh, and, it, and nil is kind of different to like an empty list or an, an empty collection, uh, nil is actually a value, legal value in itself. Um, so uh, here's another quick one, so like write an expression to add up the numbers from 1 to 10, uh, return the overall value, uh, you don't need to define a function if you don't want to, you can just uh, write an expression or you can define a function uh, if you should so wish. Have a quick go at that, and if you're really quick, you can also have a go at the uh, uh, the same thing, but without having to type in all the numbers. Just a comparison between seeing uh, how you can replace uh, values by a function and a function by values. So it should be fairly simple. Don't you don't need to overthink about it. think it. It should be how would you add something? What function could you possibly use to add numbers together? In a, in a prefix notation, but don't give anybody the answers. Because <laughs> it's not as if they could press the button and find out anyway. <laughs> um. It's the very low key, low, um, uh, low sophistication uh, exam. Stuck? Really Hopefully not. Just typing all the numbers in. That's, uh, that's the uh, that's the tricky bit. We can talk about types. Uh, yeah, we can talk about types next. Actually, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I can bring up some uh, right, examples. Well. Um, so if it's finished, have a quick look at the answers. Uh, you, you probably won't be surprised. Wait, what you um, I'm just going to bring up uh, some type of stuff. There we go. Uh, is it got types in it? Pretty sure it's got types. In it. Oh, there we go. No. There it is. So, yeah, so, what, how did I do that? Yeah, I just basically did, oh yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just adding numbers up together. Oh, I actually gave you the answers to the next one in this one, didn't I? Oops, that was a mistake. I think it was a cut and paste error there. Uh, yes. Uh, so, range one to ten just returns a list of one to ten? Uh, almost. But it isn't right. Uh, it, it returns ten num Sorry, num one to one to nine. Because tens uh, exclusive, <coughs> it's an exclusive uh, range. Yes. So tens exclusive. Uh, that, yeah, I should have cut those bits out. As but you can't just say plus that list. You have to say apply. Yeah, apply or reduce. Um, I really was going to cut those bits out, wasn't I? Yeah. Um, yeah, because what you're doing is you're. If you said plus the list, what you would be doing is adding the list, the entire list, not the individual numbers, to nothing. So you just get the list back, right? Yeah, you actually get a, a so range. You, you get yeah. a range list exception because it's the actual list that you're adding. Yeah, yeah. So if you apply, what you're doing is saying you're effectively unpacking the list, and, and each thing in the list yeah. becomes an argument to the function. Yeah. Are, are it's apply and reduce almost exactly the same thing? No. Almost no. exactly the same thing. It's there's, there's an implementation difference in terms of performance. Uh, I usually use apply because uh, it's a 
automatically meant more than reduce, mm -hmm. but uh, most people actually use reduce because in most cases it's more, slightly more efficient, but there's not much in it really. There's not a huge amount of in it. It's yeah, bone picking really. Um, but yeah, so. Well, re yeah. reduce is. Uh, reduce is a little different because reduce function always takes two arguments: the accumulator and the and the item. Whereas apply uh, unpacks however many var args into however yeah, many arguments there in an argument. List. Which yeah. is why it's slightly less efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've but got you, you basically got two. You got as we'll see with uh, so we've seen with map and range there. They're kind of they're more different because they're they're still kind of doing the same thing, but the way that they treat the arguments is different. So with um, with with um, with reduce, you're basically pulling in all the the elements, all the all the all the values, and making and returning one value. Whereas with map, you're actually basically going over each individual element and updating that rather than adding it as well. Um, although you can and then you can also do collections with collections as well. So you can basically um, you can use one collection to go over another collection and that sort of stuff as well. So there's there's a whole bunch of things you can do with data. And we're not going to get to cover all of them because there's probably I think a good chunk of the 650 functions in that is, is dealing with data, which is why again closure is really good for anything data oriented. And the last time I checked, that's pretty much every program under the sun. So uh, that's why it's a very good general pro purpose uh, language. Uh, yeah, so here, yeah, and also another thing with, uh, if you want to do range plus range, it's also a lazy sequence, so it will go, it'll, you'll get a, like, a lazy sequence error as well, because um, it's trying to add something up that it hasn't eva evaluated properly. We'll touch on lazy sequences a little bit later. Um, yeah, so reduce, again, is, um, it's like, it's, it's a bit like the basics of functional composition, you're basically using one function with another function, you're using that, that function as an argument to another function. Uh, that's not that's not gonna work on the REPL, is it? Can you if you try running it it does. It is. Not that one. The Which one before one? that. Yeah, no that was oh, a uh, deliberate yeah. error one. Yeah. <coughs> that's why it says unfortunately we can't just I don't get a I don't get a lazy related error, I get something else. What's it saying? It's a it's long casting, range. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a long range. It's yeah. long range, yeah. which is the which uh, essentially means implementation of a because range range will range actually I could do uh, if I wanted to test how big my memory heap was. Um, I could do um, I could just do I could just do range and evaluate that, and that that will warm up my computer quite nicely because basically it will just generate an infinite number of numbers. Um, and but so uh, if I was going to be a little bit more sensible, I'd uh, just take a few of those numbers. Uh, so let's take ten um, from range, pull that function into uh, there, and now evaluate this, and I get the first ten numbers, so from zero to nine. Um, so that is a bit like doing range uh, zero to uh, eleven, it's the same kind of thing, because um, range will just generate if you don't give it any. Uh, Parameters, it will just generate an infinite list. But obviously, you can't load. There's no point in loading an infinite list into your computer because it'll blow up. It doesn't matter how big your computer is; it's gonna blow up because you don't have an infinite number of memory. Even Amazon doesn't have an infinite like size of memory heap, not yet. Anyway, um, uh, so you're, it allows you to use this function uh, and just take the bit of the results you actually need. So it's an incredibly powerful, incredibly simple, but incredibly powerful technique for being able to just work on the bits of information you need. And talking of types, actually, it's a good segue into types. Um, there is a, a really nice type because there is there is types in Clojure. You just don't need to define them. Uh, you can coerce uh, things in, into types. You can even coerce things into Java objects as well. Um, I can do things something like uh, in. And that should create me a Java object uh, of an integer type with 8080. And how do I know it's a Java object and I'm not just lying to you? Well, I use uh, type uh, as a function and it will tell me what the type is. Oh, look, Java lang integer. Um, so there is types underneath there, so you can feel safe ish. It's just you don't have the compiler also kind of giving you that nudge 
uh, with closure as well, which is probably what you will miss if you're coming, especially if you're coming from Scarlet. Um, but there are types underneath there. We we're using um, we're using types from uh, from Java wherever it makes sense. Uh, and so, having said that, what do you think uh, this type will be? Uh, it's a string or a char of uh, char of array of chars. Um, it's a string. Why do you think it's? What's the nice thing about a string in Java? What's its property in terms uh, of it's state? Immutable? It's immutable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So once you create a string, you can't change that string. Uh, you actually create a new string uh, and uh, and throw a garbage collect the old one if nothing's referencing it. Um, so what do you do with all the collections in Closure? You do exactly the same. Um, do you think that's an incredibly inefficient way of doing things? That, uh, if you've got like a like a million element array and you make a copy of it rather than changing it, that sounds terribly inefficient. Luckily, we don't have to do that. So we've got uh, something called persistent data structures. So it, what it means is that if you've got a million element array and you change three elements, you basically create a new uh, a, a new collection with those three new elements. Uh, and basically point this back to the uh, all the ones you're sharing with. So you don't actually create any new memory locations except for those three. You don't create uh, like a million and three. You create three more and then just uh, have pointers back to the old ones which are not really taking up any space whatsoever. So you can clone essentially uh, um, collection after collection after collection. So basically what you're doing is you're running all these functions over all these um, collections and you're not blowing up your heap. Um, you'd have to run like billions of functions before you got anywhere near blowing up your heap. Um, unless you obviously find like duplicate and everything left, right, and center, but that's, no, that's your own fault there. Um, but yeah, so persistent data structures are really, really uh, efficient. And um, did I get a, I think I've got, no, I think I've got, uh, I can show you kind of a diagram of that as well. If you went, did anybody go to the Richard, Bur uh, Richard Burton? Warburton. Richard Warburton's talk. Uh, Richard Burton? Warburton. 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 Uh, that's why I call it. Yeah, so they were talking about uh, Java 8 collections, and you can get libraries as well. We can do the same thing with persistent date structures. So it also allows you to change things really rapidly as well, because they're quite, quite, n uh, n uh, like quite narrow. Uh, they're not very deeply nested tree, because they're basically a tree representation, uh, TRE representation in. Uh, the memory in, in the computer's uh, memory, and you, it's very, got very shallow kind of, um, uh, uh, this very shallow tree, so it's very easy and very fast and efficient to be able to update, even even like a massively large uh, data structure, you can update that and, and interrogate that really, 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 really quickly. Except if it's in a list, because then you'd have to do that sequentially, and if you were just getting values from the end of the list, that might take a long time. Um, so typically we use uh, like vectors because they're indexed, so you can basically look up things, or you use a map uh, with the keyword and then you can just look up the keyword, so you don't have to go through everything sequentially, but a list is definitely a, a linked list. So if we go back to, we go back to here, um, and do type this, uh, type, um, then that is going to be a uh, persistent list. Um, and you've got the same thing for uh, for vectors as well, except that's a persistent vector um, and a persistent map. So all the, this, there's four built-in collection types, essentially. So there's, you've got your, the list, you've got the vector, which is like an array. You've got the map, which is a hash map, and you've got sets, which is a unique set of values. Again, they can be any types, but they have to be unique. Um, and they're not sorted, but you can create a sorted uh, set as well. You can run sorted set, sorted set functions on top of it. Um, but as you can see, uh, everything is um, kind of has types or has classes because, again, it's all Java bytecode. It's all running on top of the, uh, the JVM. I see that you also have that type. That type that if you find a type or what? Uh, yeah, I, I don't really use def type that much. Do you use def type a lot, Chris? I just or? came up with a suggestion for Yeah, yeah. Um, 
sometimes with Java interop maybe. Um, yeah. Dev type does Dev type does define the type. What it ends up being is a, literally a dot class file. It can pass the Java class. Okay. So if, if you're so if you're um, if you're calling uh, closure from Java, there might be some reasons you want to do that. Okay. Um, typically, I guess most people do it the other way around. So like it's like people call Java from closure. That seems to be more, much more common okay. um, in my experience. But yeah. Um, but yeah, th it's all kind of related underneath. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, the value five is a Java Java lang long, and then there's doubles and floats and so on. Uh, one of the most interesting things is um, if I oh there we go uh, I've already done it here if I divide uh, 22 by seven what am I going to get five five well it's pretty close I, I always thought I thought it was five it's five. not actually pi 22 over yeah. seven is not exactly pi mm -hmm. um, what type so are you going to get I yeah, guess what, is the question uh, well, well, well this is going to give the value. Mm. Uh, oh, look, the value is 22 over 7. Oh, what? it's a fractional type. Yes, exactly. So it's, a ra it's, it's called a ratio, a ratio. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and it's a fractional type. So, um, And what do you think the advantage of that is? What do you yeah, not lose? The advantage, uh, the the advantage is that lazy evaluation. It, yeah, it's, it, is, it is a very simple version of lazy evaluation, and it is like allowing you to keep the precision. If you do want to, this is just an example of we can't, here we're coercing it because we're basically specifying a context of the precision. Because uh, it's 7.0 is a value, uh, like it's not an entity value, it's a, it's a different value. So I think it's a, a I can never remember if it's a float or a double, uh, but it's one of those. Um, actually, there, what is it? A ratio is the only way. On it, right? <coughs> yeah, there yeah. Go. Yeah. Ratio, having a ratio type is the only way to maintain proper precision. So it's a double, with, yeah. With um, numbers that don't resolve themselves to decimals. So yeah. anything that's you know, yeah. a third, for instance, in the obvious example, you can't well, cut. Decimal is a bit of right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're all, but but with the ratio, you are keeping it's the absolute double. precision. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going. <coughs> so seven point zero close will um, it evaluate that as, as double. So when it divides that close. by twenty two, so you've got a context of I'm oh dividing yeah, right. uh, that integer by double. So I'm I'm saying what kind of position I want, so then it will return a double for me. Um, and so you can get it to do a, a float and other things like that as well. Um, and it, one of the interesting things I, I came across by accident was, uh, was actually, um, uh, that's not a good example, is it? No. Um, uh, it actually kind of minimizes the, oh, there you go. Uh, actually takes it down to the smallest fraction. Uh, which is really co quite cool as well. So again, it's saving a bit of space. Um, it simplifies the fraction. Yes. Yeah. So if you've got a really big number, you're kind of, you know, divided by another big number, it might actually go down to something smaller. So it does the smallest thing possible without actually losing any precision whatsoever. And you can pass this around just like any other value. Uh, so actually typing in um, so divided by two is a is actually a value. Is actually a legal value. You divide eight by two, you get wrong. You get four. Yeah, you'll that's get. Not uh, gonna, then it's not going to show a story. Yeah, you'll just that. get four. You can do eight by two, you just get four. Um, uh, you can do eight by three. Where did you get there? Oh, you, you get, get five. Get, oh, you get it. Okay, right. You get six by two. Oh, there you go. Um, but yeah, so that's really nice. You can pass it around. And one of the reasons this works, one of the reasons you can actually type this is because you've got prefix notation. Um, so this, that's just treating it like a, a value. You, you couldn't do that in Java because it would just give you a result. It would divide seven by two. Uh, but because all our uh, all our functions are in lists and they um, and they're, they're prefix operators, then we can actually have syntax like seven divided by two that actually works because the divided is just part of the the name of that uh, value. And so when I, when I have uh, 27 uh, by 7 and then multiply 7 and it's a big game afterwards. Okay. Um, yep. You know why it yeah, it will. Um, why it would be a big game? Yeah. Because it's trying to maintain the highest precision it can possibly do. So right. it'll coerce um, int into big ints where it yeah. thinks it's appropriate. And the same with decimals. So you'll get doubles going into 
um, to big decimal. Okay. So it'll be like that. Ooh, 22 N. I'm getting a long Which that. is a big in. Yeah, it's a big in. There we go. So that's the shorthand version of writing a big in to yeah. 22 N. So if you put a big N on the end, it's a big in. If you, put, if you see a big M, M on the end, it's a big decimal. Yeah. So, and you can also do this and stuff as well. If you really want to kind of delve into the, the, the guts and underneath stuff, you can look at that as well. And you can call it the Java interop stuff. So you can, it's like map is in Java Lang, so you can just basically call it map. Uh, I think you can actually do pi in here as well. Um, <coughs> What's that slash uh, notation? Uh, so it, it's... So, so it's you've got the same as math dot square. You've got Java root. Java line, and inside Java line you've got you've got the math object. Yeah. And inside the math object you've this got you've got a pi, you've got a pi variable, like static variable. Uh -huh. So basically uh, you don't need to include the Java it's, it is like typing uh, Java, Java uh, dot, dot line dot, line dot, dot math. math. Oh, okay, it's like yeah. statically importing that. Yeah, so that's the namespace. Before the slash is the namespace, and after the slash is the actual either the variable or the function. So in Java interop like that, the slash is effectively calling either a static variable field or, or a static method call. Well, it's, it's, it's the kind of namespace separate. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's it whatever. This, this could be a function as well, like in here, like a square root. Uh, obviously, I'm not, I don't have an actual object here, so these things have to be a static, uh, otherwise I'd have to instantiate an object of that type first. Uh, but that's quite easy because you can do, um, you can use the dots, I mean, you can do, um, I can't think of any objects now. It's so long since I've done uh, Java. But essentially you don't have to do... Um, and why don't do two, two uppercase on a string, oh yeah, on a string literal? Two. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can basically go, uh, Like so it'll pick up the closest, the first object yeah. that has the function. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and because, because the two, let's say, the two upper existed only for. Well, that's a string. So that, that that string yeah. thing is a Java dot line dot string. Yeah, good old fashioned Java string. Yeah. So I'm so calling the dot two uppercase method on the string class. It knows what so type it is, so it can uh, the string instance. Uh, that's right, the right. operator yeah. is acting yeah. on the, it's as good if as you were, upper, upper if you're in If you're pulling in, if you're pulling in your own uh, Java objects, then you would have to do, um, I think it's like a, do like a new and then your object, your objects. Yeah, you can do dot, and <coughs> dot space. Uh, and or you can also do the short form, which you know, as Chris says, is dot your yeah. objects name. But then you would need to import that objects or the library that, that object was in uh, or first or, or I suppose fully specify it. Yeah, or fully specify it. Well, uh, yeah, you'd, even, you'd have to import it anyway before you specify it. In the project, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Got people at the back. Just trying to come in. Uh, um, so I think we touched on oh my honesty. I think I mainly put this thing so I could do Skynet because if you're going to write uh, Skynet, you'd write in Clojure these days because um, you can modify stuff so you can actually we as you see we've been redefining defs as well so you can actually so while, while uh, the collection you might use with a def is going to be immutable you can basically change the names that are pointing to those things as well so you can redefine what a name points to so the name that points to a value is not immutable it's, you can mutate that essentially you can point it to other things but the things it's pointing to are always mutable. You're not changing them unless you use an atom, as we mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go into home. I, I can I just promised somebody I'd mention the word because it's yeah. If you forget about it, don't worry about it. It's not that important. But it is uh, it is one of the features of uh, closure. Closure. Mm. Mm, there we go. Um, Lifetime project for indeed. So let's do a little bit more uh, very, very challenging um, functions. So here's a function. Uh, so we're talking about higher order functions. So basically using functions as arguments to the functions. Um, and so try and create a name function higher order which adds uh, a value to a number twice. I'm smiling because I've got that example in one of my little pet teach yourself project. 
surprise you. Might be. You either, you'll either get this or you won't. And if you don't get it, don't worry, because I don't uh, think we've come up with an example twice. of this. But just try and think about how you would do it. Um, there's a clue in uh, that word called function. There may be a function called function, which I didn't know about until recently. Or oh, actually, no, I, what did I do that? I did that with the. Um, well, that I was know the prompt, how I did it. it. Yeah, that was the prompt, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you really get stuck, then you can. Oh, 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 you don't get any uh, marks for, for looking. You don't, get, you don't lose any marks for looking. Because you don't get any marks, don't <laughs> So that would be the reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a lot of editing on this video. <laughs> make it. Is this recorded? Um, I think so. It is not recorded. No, it's, it's done in an hour and 30 minutes, which is about right. Oh, you are recording it. I'm recording it ah. on my little GoPro. It's not recording you, don't worry. It's only recording me being a, an idiot, so that's fine. Hello, hello world. Now you're going to erase those bits, right? Well, it's just in case I say something I, I don't know I know. <laughs> Sometimes I say things I didn't realize I knew them, and then I forget them because I've forgotten I said them. And then it'd be, I wish I'd video, I wish I'd watch that. So you watch your own videos for hours together? Well, sometimes. So, so you can teach yourself. Exactly, yeah, I was forgetting. <laughs> this is why I do these workshops, so I can actually teach myself something. Because people ask me questions and think, oh yeah, that's how it works. So there we go. Um, so we, we learn together. That's the best way. Because then I don't confuse you too much, hopefully. Uh, how are we doing? Poor, bad. Oh dear. This one's a little bit more tricky, I think. Uh, it, it does take a while to get into kind of thinking uh, in functions. Um, and uh, we haven't uh, introduced this syntax yet, so uh, that might be a bit unfair. Um, Is there a difference between that and that pen? Yes. Yes. So let's go. Def is like a let, isn't it? Def pen is defining. Well, they're, they're Different and the same. <coughs> they're, uh, both, they're both defining. Yes. Because uh, um, I don't think I've got an example here, but um, I must stick it in. Yeah, there we go. Um, so if I can, so def, uh, uh, I'll get, so def takes a name, you just make up whatever your name you want to. Obviously, it needs to be unique with inside that, uh, that namespace. Yeah. Um, so he'll call it Fred, and then I'm going to call it. Uh, Um, and so oh, I'm free, free. I will be at six o'clock. Um, and you can do def n, uh, but def n is specific. Is a specific kind of def. So it's for defining a function. So you don't define. So here I consider this as a data structure. So I consider I am free as a data structure. It's a string. It actually is a data structure inside Closure because you can do things with it. You can run functions on it. You can pull it apart and do other things with it. You can treat it like a, like a very simple collection, um, uh, obviously all of one type. And um, with defn, you're, you're giving it a name, so my function. Uh, uh, you give it a parameter, uh, and then you have some uh, behavior here, which might be string. Uh, which, uh, so I think, I think in your first slide, John, it, it showed a good, a good example, because def yeah. Def gives a name to a value. The value might be a function, right? Yeah. Yeah, because what you can and do. And so you can do def. Did you want to? Yeah. 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 So you can do def my function, uh, and then uh, the value of that function, rather than being a string or a, or a collection, is actually the function definition. It's oops, I pressed the wrong button. Oh, oh dear. Uh, is actually a function. So uh, it, I can define a function like this wow. just by a, an anonymous function, just by doing function uh, args uh, and then uh, string. Uh, uh, so that's my anonymous function. Um, so I can do the same thing in here. I can basically do. Uh, actually, I can just basically do that. Uh, so yeah, so basically, I'm using def to define a name, 
but instead of pointing to a value, it's pointing to some behavior, some uh, an actual function itself. And those are semantically equivalent. Uh, it's just more convenient to, to use defn because you're typing a few characters and it keeps the, the, the code nice and clean, nice and simple. Um, so can I ask an even dumber question? Yeah, sure. That wasn't a dumb question. That was no. a very good question. Yeah, that's a very important fundamental question. If, if I have uh, a job, which is full of these functions, yeah. how do I know which one I'm going to run? How do I say this is where I start? Yeah, so if we go right back to the project that we created, uh, many, many years ago, it's still in Emacs, isn't it, yes. Uh, um, yeah, so when it creates something, it creates a foo thing, but you typically, uh, if you're going to create an application, uh, you, uh, you have def and uh, dash main, which is uh, just a, a naming convention for uh, like a main function. You can have any function as your main function, but typically you call it main because it's kind of obvious. Um, and then you'd obviously define some behavior in here, um, and then if you, uh, so by convention, Lining will run the main file, but you can also go into uh, your uh, project file, oops, wherever it is, I've got a lot of crap in here, there we go, uh, and actually just specify the, uh, what the main is, and then you give it the full um, namespace, so this is DevOps, oh, there we go, thank you, Emacs, uh, and then, um, yeah. So that tells uh, Dev projects. It tells Lining and which is the which is the main which is the namespace to start into. So it doesn't have to be core. Core is like the equivalent of main uh, as the namespace. Core is just the file name inside a folder called devox underscore UK. Um, and if I don't specify anything else, it will just look for the dash main uh, name inside the core file uh, and run that. And then that calls all the other functions in whatever order uh, your uh, application decides is the, the right way to call them. So basically, you'll have like functions, and they'll call other functions. Then for that function to fully evaluate, it might call another one, and that might call another one, and so on and so on and so on. And then it'll pop back a result, and then some other event will come in, and you'll call the functions again, and so on and so on. So you might just run your program once, and it, it calls a whole bunch of functions. You get a value back, and it prints it out on the command line. So you can just do Java jar, uh, uh, and then specify the the, the namespace, and, the, and 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 off you go. You can call it that way as well. So you can call it just from the Java command line. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically, there are no loops. Yeah, that's from yeah, I'll keep on getting my high score there. So did people manage to get a successful list of books? Thanks very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's quick, I'm going to quickly go through how I did it. Uh, very quickly, two, take, two segments. Thanks a lot, cheers. So I, I just uh, slept in the book, um, and uh, I've also I also write a, a little extra bit where I'm, I'm just defining a get book, so I could um, I could either slept slept the book or I rewrote it a little bit so I could just basically give it any book URL and it would pull it from the internet. Um, so this is a refinement, so I don't actually need that first line anymore. Um, I know at some point I'm, I'm going to need to filter out the common words, so I can pull in the common words uh, again. I, in the example on the website, I'm using a, uh, a text file on the internet. This is the same file I've just downloaded locally, just in case the internet doesn't work. Um, and uh, so I just slap that in. And then what I normally do is, uh, so I can I can kind of comment these out, and I can see which ones um, are actually what each individual uh, expression is doing. So I'm using a what they call a reader macro, it's just a different way to comment out uh, an entire expression. So I'm just using a hash underscore, and that will say to, to closure, just to completely ignore the next complete expression, but then carry on with the expression after that as if, it, uh, 
as if the, the other line didn't exist. So I can I can do that um, all the way down, uh, and I can just see what get but URL does for me. Uh, oops. And uh, and then I can play around with it and experiment with each of the um, each of the lines, uh, each of the functions I'm, I'm using. And so I'm just going to call instead of just slurping it in, I'm, I'm calling this main function, which is going to call uh, the book. Thing. Oh, what have I done there? Did I not evaluate something? No, main. Oh, I didn't evaluate main, that's why. Oops. Uh, yeah, I forgot to evaluate it after I did that there. Uh, so it's going to pull the book in. Um, actually, there's a better way to do that than that. Um, book, book. So it's pulling the whole text of the book in as one cryptic string. I don't really want to do that. I want to break that down into. Uh, the actual words, so if I uh, and then reevaluate that and call this, uh, the, call this again. So now I've just got the actual individual words rather than one big text string. Um, and then um, it's got the in. I don't want the. So let's remove um, uh, let's remove the common words, for example. So there's a reason why that is still there, because it's not low case, yes, so I'll just pop it. So if I do low case, get rid of that, uh, evaluate this again, uh, let me get the so, oops, yeah, there we go, uh, so now we've got rid of the, uh, but we don't know how, what, so we've got all the words, we don't know how often they're appearing. So there's a really nice little magic uh, function called frequencies, which is just going to create a map for us um, uh, of uh, all the strings and, and kind of count up how many individual, uh, how many times the words appear. Um, so that's quite nice. Uh, so let's evaluate that. So now we've got uh, some mountings, one, twice, but it's not really in order. Um, we don't know which is the which, we don't really want to have to read through them to find them. Uh, so we can sort, so we sort by value. So it's, so here we've actually, just made that a little bit bigger, you can actually see that this is a map, because we've got the curly bracket there, so it's, it re re uh, frequencies have returned a map collection for us. So we've got the, the, the key and the value, so the keys are the actual strings and the value is how often the strings appear um, and so we c if we sort by value then we're not sorting by keys we're sorting by the values so we'll sort by so uh, one will come first then all the twos then all the fours and so on and so on uh, so we evaluate that and then we do control P so now we've got them all sorted uh, and it's actually put them into each of them into vectors now. Um, uh, so we've got the ones, so we could scroll all the way down to the bottom and find out what was going on. But then why go all the way to that trouble when we can just do reverse? And so we can comment that, um, evaluate this again, uh, and finally call main again. And surprise, surprise, uh, oops, the, uh, the most common word in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is Arthur, who's obviously the main character of the book, so we would expect that. Um, so I've gone through and, and this has returned it as a list of uh, vectors, essentially. So, um, so each, uh, so sometimes you do need to play around with what kind of uh, things you get back. Uh, sometimes uh, yeah, you don't quite get the um, uh, collection you want, but it's very easy to convert from one collection to another because they can take any types and any structures inside them as well. Obviously, you got some constraints. Uh, going to and from a map, uh, it needs to be legal. Uh, and if you go into a set, then you're going to lose anything that's not you uh, that's not unique as well. Uh, but yeah, it, it's really easy to kind of use these um, 
threading macro and the comments as well to basically experiment and figure out what's actually going on and getting feedback from your REPL as to what's actually happening. So you don't need to go through a compile cycle, you don't need to set up debug points, you can actually just use the REPL for a lot of the experimentation work uh, and get done really quickly uh, and get your application built and focus on how I should actually design it uh, and how um, does it meet the requirements that people want it to in the first place. It's more common to write functions like that for macros than actual the in this big way. When they get big, when they get big, yeah, then yeah, I mean you just I if you wrote that the this big way, and you'd have to evaluate from the inside out. And it's yeah. it's quite a lot to read. Yeah. I think it's the the higher level you get up in your application yeah. code. So the more like the more closer you are to the main entry point of your code, the more likely you're going to have multiple things all like uh, in in all working together. Like, um, and, uh, and and also in like in uh, like a top part of the namespace, you might find that as well. So you might find it more likely at the the higher levels of your code. If you like if you got lots of little low level codes and they're all complex, then it, it is a sign of maybe there's too much complexity in that particular namespace, but if, you, if you're going to expect complexity, you want it just in the main uh, main entry point into your application. That's where you, it's fine. It's it's more acceptable to have more complexity in there because it's just one place you can see. You can basically see everything that's going on from a, an abstracted level, so that's fine. Uh, it's just if you've got a lot more complexity every, every single word, then it makes it harder to actually understand what your program's doing. The what, sorry? Oh, the bot, yeah. That is a good question. It's uh, a function. It must be a function. Yeah, yeah. it's a function. Uh, so k keywords, keywords are the ones with colon on the front, they always evaluate to themselves. Oh, uh, yes, of course it's, yes. Anything, anything like that, that, that's, the, the, the letters VAL, right, or sort hyphen by, are actually a symbol. We haven't really mentioned that, but symbols get, tr generally symbols are things that will evaluate to a value. So they're used for the names of functions and uh, names of macros and that kind of thing. Um, keywords always evaluate to themselves and also look themselves up in maps, which you've probably seen when we've been doing so. Yeah. So if, if you look at the actual uh, doc string for sort by, you can kind of see the parameter list it takes. Uh, hopefully you can read that. Key function. So it's got a key function, which is what value. So basically a function that will work, work on like map, uh, maps keys. Uh, and so it will basically look up and get use the keys to get up all the values and then all, uh, basically sort the map, create a new map sorted by the way that uh, the, the order of the keys. So why didn't we have to do sort by and then parentheses about collection and collection? Uh, so sort by, it, it's a bit like uh, map, so sort by, uh, then val, and then it would have been the, the map, yeah, okay. um, where is it, curly things, so it's, it's like the map in there. Um, so that's the, that's the syntax of the, Function, which is a bit like uh, the the map function. So you do map inc, uh, and then uh, one, uh, one, two, three. It's a similar kind of. Um, some people call it like functor. So like a, a function that uses a function on something else. It's going to apply val here, map. Like yeah, like exactly. So yeah, so val is applied to every kind of like uh, key value pair, and then it can sort them. It can return result uh, sorted. So it's uh, it it does take a little bit of kind of twisting your mind into these things, but it it is quite powerful when you're dealing with a lot of data to do this. So it's quite cool. It took me a while, but uh, I got there. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's all home iconic as well, so that's cool. There we go. We <laughs> say home iconic more often. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's in the room now, so. Uh, yes. He didn't. I, I said it earlier as well when you weren't here. Yeah, the advantage of a home icon is it really comes in when you start writing macros. But 
yeah, there are too yeah. many of. We don't. So macros are really powerful, but they also get used sparsely because the big problem with macros is, unlike functions, they don't compose well. So if you if you're composing, you know, you've got a macro that returns something that then another macro is trying to do something with. The little code factories, right? And they don't. That factory is going to spit out some code that you can't really evaluate until it's spread it out, mm -hmm. and it's going to go in the compile cycle and. and then you've got another macro trying to deal with something that's metadata that hasn't really resolved itself into anything. So you can't compose macros. Really. Yeah, I mean, it does depend a little bit on the macros, but yeah, yeah you it does. Can't generally you speaking, can't you can't compose yeah, you can do, yeah. I mean, so that's why we use them for like things like def, def and, yeah. uh, for example, a little, little bit of extra syntactic yeah, sugar yeah, that yeah. Makes, makes the language just Adding a bit more streamlined. <laughs> and it's like, usually people will write a, a macro to get rid of what would otherwise be classed as boilerplate code, uh, which I'm sure every Java developer would love to get rid of a whole bunch of boilerplate code. Um, so yeah, and then this is just built in. So we can, and we can also extend the language to do things that uh, the designers didn't consider originally. So, and like for example, uh, yeah, a lot of the libraries. I mean, you've got Core Async that uses um, like channels, and it's got a little channel notation that's quite nice and simple. Again, those are macros uh, that we've added, which makes the language more rich. Um, and things like core, um, core logic, which is um, yeah, basically prolog that's been added into uh, Clojure as well. So there's just some amazing languages, uh, libraries that have just been added that makes Clojure's from not being this small, but like be this big. Uh, it, it's, we just basically steal all the really good ideas from everybody else implement them really quickly. So. Yeah, I mean, Core Async's uh, um, unashamed admitted rip-off of ideas out of Go. Uh, Go yeah, line. well, Go ripped it off somebody else. So well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the CSP stuff came yeah, from exactly. Erlang. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so it's, it's all pretty cool. Uh, any final questions? If not, then thanks very much for sticking around for so long. Um, and I think we're going to get kicked out in a few minutes. But yeah, uh, I think we might. <coughs> Thanks for your dedication and endurance. Um, you. So, yeah. um, and if you do want to join up to the, uh, we've got a meetup site. Uh, yeah. Um, if you uh, if you want if you want if you're gang up, well we do quite a lot of meetups actually a, a month. So uh, there's one tomorrow. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so we do two or three, sometimes four co closure dojos a month. So there's plenty of opportunity to go there. Uh, we do one just south of Southwark Bridge. There's one in the West End. So occasionally there's one in uh, Canary Wharf. Yeah, that's, what. that's, a, that's an And then Chris does one at Skills Matter as well. Uh, but yeah, there's tons of stuff on here. I mean, we've been running this for three months. We've already done uh, 11. We've done 11 meets meetups in no, in two months. Yeah, just over two months. Just over two months. We've done 11 meetups already. Yeah. But we've done a lot more than that. We just only just started the uh, meetup two months ago because nobody could find our Google groups. There we go. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have you have interesting topics there? What do you what do you what do you have There's uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of interesting talks. We get uh, like a talk once a month, although I think not this month. But no, we can't. We, we didn't have any. Usually, usually we have like some really interesting talks. So if you go to the Skills Matter mm -hmm. website, there's a whole bunch of talks on that. Yeah, no, but for the uh, for the hackathon, for the hackathon. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, we get uh, so it's 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 a mixture of uh, uh, Java, Scala, and Clojure people, mm -hmm. and there's uh, there's also like the type level, yeah, Scala, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, Scala group. They they they're being quite popular now, so they come along. Um, so the the Clojure workshop is John teaching people. Clojure. Yeah, Clojure workshop tomorrow is going to be very similar to this one. Um, uh, but the, yeah, I, I try to do it once a month. I might not be doing it. I might, I might take a little break in summer. But, uh, but yeah, I'll, I try and do something different every month. But it, it's mainly aimed at like people who are relatively new. Um, no, but there'll be there's always some new stuff because there's plenty of new stuff to pick up. Isn't there? Yeah. Well, I learned something in that. Which did, what did you learn? Um, I I don't think I've used sort by with with uh, Val before. Yeah, there's some cool stuff. I, I did steal some of the ideas off the internet as well. So. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, we didn't get to I'd use sort by just using it to, um, just on a simple oh, sort, yeah. passing it, yeah. Yeah. passing it a less than or greater than to, to do yeah. whatever yeah. it's sending or descending. I, I, I didn't get to uh, list compression. There's some no, nice, nice list compression stuff there. Uh, That's really nice. List compression is quite nice. Around what? Basically, four. Yeah, basically, using four. It's very nice because it's not a Java four. No, no, it's a list comprehension, a proper, not a, a not, form, yeah. yeah, it's like a Haskell yeah. list comprehension yeah. rather than a, yeah. rather than a full yeah. statement. Well, yeah. for a start, it's an expression, yeah, like exactly. everything is an expression. Yeah. Uh, everything which is fun. It's doing, Okay. Just using four. Each time having a range of naught to nine. Yeah, yeah, so you've got the nested four list comprehension. I think I did nested. Well, yeah, no. But yeah, it's just yeah, yeah, one with it. So you've got like some, yeah, but you've got okay. it's there. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit like let you kind of basically, you're assigning a whole bunch of things there and you just basically yeah. generate numbers. Well, by, ne by nested, what I meant was. the problem. the collision detection off. Shush. No, we never do things like that. <laughs> I must have that resync pattern wrong because it's splitting everything into uh. characters rather than a sequence of characters. Thank you very much, Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was okay. But on, oh, look. A brief bit of quite birds.
supposed to be easy to hack this game. Yeah, I don't think you meant to make it hard to hack. <laughs> it's a lot easier to hack it with closer script than with JavaScript. Sorting it by count the values in the map. I could do, yeah. yeah. But it's uh, it's really kind of easy to. Um, I mean, uh, it's really kind of easy to see how quickly you can kind of change things. I like just change branches, and I've instantly got the, the the different versions. So I can test out things really, really simply. It's just live injecting a different closure script into that, and if I do change the um, collision, it, it'll. Works straight away, or not works straight away. Mm. Sorting by 